Okay, I think uh, we can start. Okay, so um, let, let me first uh, sort of draw uh, what we had. We're going to continue our discussion on basically towards laser cooling. I mean, so we are trying to uh, give a brief plea what is what we need and we are looking at the details. So uh, what uh, remember uh, this thing which we will always need is the uh, energy levels themselves, right? So we have this, let's say, we're taking specifically the case of uh, 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 rubidium uh, atom and I'm just drawing the relevant energy levels now. I'm not drawing the uh, J equal to one by uh, two uh, state. I'm drawing just the uh, ground state and excited states. And we said that uh, these will have these hyperfine levels. So in the ground state, there is a F equal to one and F equal to two. And here we have uh, four states, right? So F prime equal to three, two, one, and zero. And uh, 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 we want to be uh, driving this transition, which is this 780 nanometer transition which is a uh, delta F uh, equal to plus one transition. And this is a cycling transition because atoms cannot come back to F equal to one. Turns out that um, uh, once in a while atoms for some reason do come back to uh, F equal to one, but that's not a big problem because you can do uh, put another laser, tune it from here to somewhere here and that will put it back in the cycle. So it will go from F equal to one to two and then the two can do decay back to two with 50% probability. And once it does that, it goes on emitting and absorbing uh, light at 17 nanometer. And this absorption gives it momentum kick and that's how it cools. And we're trying to figure out how basically to keep the atom on uh, resonance all the time. That's one thing. And what is sort of, what are the details of this interaction between this atom and the uh, and light, right? And we saw that magnetic field will have to play a major role in this laser cool, cooling experience. So uh, what we uh, what we wrote down towards the end of the class is that if I have uh, if I just model this uh, this two to three transition, which is what I'm interested in, uh, as a two level system, and if do not worry about anything else, then for this two level system uh, uh, one and two, which is uh, which are the energy difference of uh, h bar omega zero, uh, uh, we said that uh, if I start at t equal to zero. Uh, uh, if I uh, if the system is at in uh, as, uh, system in one, then at a later time t, uh, uh, the probability that I will find the system uh, uh, in a in the state two is given by this c two t mod squared. This is the probability of finding the state in state two. Uh, uh, so this is uh, probability uh, in uh, to find in. And this we said is uh, omega squared, capital omega squared divided by capital omega squared plus delta squared. And then there was a, a square um, um, uh, No, uh, so what were these uh, deltas? The delta was uh, the detuning, which is the frequency of the laser, which is external frequency of the electric field, which is the drive frequency, minus the natural frequency of the system, which is basically this energy difference divided by h bar. So that was the detuning. Uh, if it is, if delta is negative, we call it red detuning. If it is uh, positive, we call it blue detuning, right? And uh, towards, uh, later on, we'll try to say that, uh, for laser cooling to work, this delta has to be negative. So the omega, so the so you are driving this transition, uh, and your laser frequency has to be less than this transition, which is what I have drawn here as well. So we'll see why that is the case. And uh, what was this capital omega? This capital omega uh, was basically the uh, transition uh, uh, 
metric elements. It was a strength. It represents the strength of the transition. So uh, you go from, so I think the way we wrote it is uh, one, two, I think, E R dot E zero, two, right? So this is the Rabi frequency. If I multiply by H bar, then I get energy scale. And this is, uh, uh, this is the last, uh, sort of rate at which the system oscillates. Right? So if I put delta equal to uh, zero, um, then uh, I will have Rabi oscillations uh, uh, in the system. So, uh, so remember now the way we got to this uh, place is that we made certain approximations and one of the major ones, uh, which also people ask questions about was this rotating wave approximation, right? So we made a rotating, we dropped certain terms, omega plus omega zero terms we dropped. So, uh, so they, it turns out that, so you can look at it in slightly different way. So here in this way, the way we are doing it is we quantize the atom uh, and we were left the field unquantized and it was causing transition with a perturbation. So if you want to do a slightly better job, you would put the atom and the photon. So a photon, when I say photon, I'm sort of thinking of quantized field, but uh, what I'm basically uh, hinting is that I want slightly more parity, I mean, same status between atom and photon. So I could say, look, if I have one photon in the system, right? Uh, and if the photon is uh, uh, at some frequency, uh, let's say H bar omega is the energy, uh, of the photon, then uh, I could write that together the system, so the, let's say one is the system st state of the system. I could also write the photon state. So suppose I could have a photon, I have, could have system in state one and the photon, let's say in uh, N equal to one, N equal to one means one photon. I could, this photon could be absorbed, right? And I could have a state, uh, atom going to state two, and uh, and the, the photon is lost. I don't have any more photon in the system. So I have uh, uh, n equal to zero, right? So if this photon energy was exactly equal to H bar omega, uh, omega then these two, these together, whatever the energy of these together is, that would be equal to whatever the energy of this, uh, the atom and the photon is together, right? Um, so turns, turns out if, so the, for example, if the photon is not, so if suppose the photon is not on resonance, then this will not be exactly uh, 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 exactly the same energy. And that, uh, so this, this, you can look at this problem in this way. And this is uh, this, this discussed in, uh, uh, it's called a dress state picture. Uh, dress state picture and is uh, 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 done in, uh, for example, Cohen Tanoji is one of the uh, person who has done it extensively. Uh, and this is the same fellow who, whose book you probably read. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah. So what 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 so what what is sort of going on here is the following: that as I was saying, that you could map any this two-level system. You can also think of spins, two-level system. So suppose we had spins, and uh, I have a spin half system. So I have spin uh, uh, spin s equal to one by two. And I, it could be one by two plus one by two uh, or, or, or minus one by two, uh, of course, with h bars. Uh, we know that we can uh, describe these systems in terms of this uh, uh, Pauli matrices, right? Sigma. Right? So these spin half systems have two states. I can describe them in terms of Pauli matrices. And uh, so I can, uh, these are uh, one, zero, zero, minus one, right? So if I put a spin half system in a magnetic field in a z direction, I can find out its energy, which will be this uh, uh, h zero, which is equal to, in this case, it's just uh, uh, mu z uh, uh, times uh, b z. Let's say b z is b, and mu z uh, is this fellow. Uh, mu z uh, uh, will be related to the spin s z, and s z is related to sigma z by just h bar by two. So what my uh, my Hamiltonian will basically look look like h bar, uh, let's say omega zero, omega zero is nothing but, but, but um, something times uh, b, right? Uh, and then I will have this matrix uh, look like this. Right? So this is uh, simply minus uh, mu s dot uh, b kind of integration. So in, 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 uh, at the moment I have a, I have a magnetic uh, field, I have this energy scale which comes in the system, h bar omega zero. So this uh, is the energy, same energy uh, which is, uh, 
uh, uh, for the two level system right now the important thing to notice here is that there are only elements which are on the diagonal the off diagonal elements are missing right and um, if you want off diagonal elements right so these are matrix elements so these are this is a so this is a, uh, uh, this is a matrix element uh, okay okay right so here you have for example you have a matrix element which is some if you need something you need something which is between 2 and 1 right so this is a0 uh, sandwich between these two states and that is zero and because that is zero you cannot cause basically a transition is that you give you solve this you put a system in one of these states it stays there one way uh, if you want to induce a transition actually you have to have elements on this of diagonal uh, terms and uh, um, so in general this uh, interaction hamiltonian will have something which is here here and nothing here if you uh, if you get that then you will you will try, and then you write your total hamiltonian as h0 plus h right and then you will have you can have systems going from state one and state two. Uh, what what do these look like? These look like uh, so I have my uh, two h i uh, and one so omega and omega star kind of thing. So these these are basically my uh, basically nothing but uh, omega and omega star. So the uh, and. Uh, so there is a direct analogy. I mean, there is a direct correspondence between this picture and this picture. Right? So you can start with a you can uh, okay uh, okay. So you can start with this Hamiltonian, right? Then h zero plus h i, and then you can put your system in state one, and you can ask well, how does the system evolve, right? How the system evolve? You you just have to diagonalize this Hamiltonian Hamiltonian h zero plus h i, find the energy eigenvalues, and then they evolve as e to the power minus i energy times t by h bar times whatever the state was. So, of course, this state initially the eigenstate is not going to be the state 2 and 1. This is something combination, but a combination of a alpha state. But from that, you know, what is the, you can find out what is the probability of finding it in say, state 2. You find alpha, take a projection on state 2, you will know what is mod c2 square and that will match exactly this one. Right. So, there is, um, um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so, um, formally, I mean, if you want to proceed the, uh, 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 in the quantum mechanics way, so what uh, is happening is the following that to have these elements here, you actually need and uh, you need some the Pauli matrices sigma x and sigma y to come, come in because these are the ones which have these off diagonal. Right? And this is what I was talking about also about this transverse magnetic field. Right? So you have to have magnetic field or in poly spin matrices in the transverse direction, right? So, uh, uh, so yeah. So, for example, uh, if you have sigma x, uh, uh, you will have. Uh, I'll just get confused about this, but one zero. And if you have sigma y, you will have zero i. Or maybe in my notation, right? So, uh, so if you feel, put a field in the B direction, this is you will get. So basically, if you put a magnetic field in, in, let's say, not only in the z direction, but also in the x direction, then when you do mu dot b, you will have to multiply with this sigma x and sigma z, and then your Hamiltonian will have all the terms, off diagonal and on, the, uh, as well as on the on diagonal term, and that will give you the dynamics. Uh, so, uh, okay, so. Yeah, let's see if we can do this. So, so suppose I have this uh, transverse field. Let's say I uh, put this thing I was talking about. So let's say I have a transverse field which I'm calling B1, and this B1 is in the xy plane. Okay. So and it is rotating. Like suppose I, I, the questions are there are questions about rotating there. So let's see what happens. I mean, so we so suppose I write this as some constant, uh, and then it's a rotating field. So let's write it. Uh, um, x cap cos omega t plus y cap sin omega t with some constant. And this I have written in the constant this way because it will just easy to cancel out certain terms. So if you put uh, this in uh, 
uh, in, in, in uh, this uh, uh, this spin in this magnetic field, uh, a kind of magnetic field. When you do mu not b, you will get mu x here. Uh, sigma, so, so you get a sigma uh, x over here and a sigma y over here, right? Because the spin will have all the, all the components. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this uh, remember that this, this uh, is z is, for example, one by two h bar sigma z and so on, right? So, and, and mu is uh, some constant time is, is uh, some gamma time just z, right? So you put uh, put put that, and when you do that, uh, when you do, do s dot uh, uh, x, you will get uh, x cap. You will get the s x part, and here you will get a s y, and therefore you will get uh, as a Pauli matrix uh, sigma x over here and sigma y over here. So your Hamiltonian will basically be of the form. And, uh, so this gamma, there will be a gamma here. So that that's why I wrote it in this form. So it will be half h bar omega r. And then I have a sigma x cos omega t plus sigma y sine omega t. This omega is the uh, frequency at which my drive is rotated, right? Which is in, in our case for atoms, it will be the laser frequency. Okay, so uh, so now I want to see uh, look at this problem in some with in this uh, in the rotating frame, right? So uh, what what do I mean? So I mean the following. So my total Hamiltonian is h zero plus h i, right? <clears throat> so if I want to go to a rotating frame, so suppose in without rotation my wave function is psi, and I want to go to a frame which is rotating, you know this is uh, so let's call that psi r. If the rotation is by angle phi, right? Then, uh, if uh, you can say you can show that this is uh, uh, the form of the uh, uh, that it takes is e to the power minus i uh, phi, uh, which is the amount of rota rotation. And then something which is a generator of rotation. Generator of rotation is angular momentum, so that's j, and then the axis of rotation dot n cap, so whichever axis it is, and then this state. Okay. So in a rot at a frame which is uh, rotated by phi, this is what the new wave function looks like. Okay, uh, um, there is standard references, uh, Sakurai and all will have this, these things. And you see this structure is very sim similar to how it trans translates in energy e to the power minus i e t. And it's not a coincidence. It is, that is a time translation. This is a uh, sort of rotation. So the, the, the forms look very similar. Now, uh, this phi, in our case, we can replace that. Suppose my phi, the rotation is uh, is basically an angle, so it's I re replace it by omega t, right? So omega is my drive frequency. I want to rotate along with the drive, so uh, this is my rotated wave function. Now, if uh, 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 so, now we also are not considered we considered with the total. I'm sort of talking about two. Uh, uh, two level system. So J can be replaced just by the spin. So this will be S dot N cap and support N, N cap is the Z direction. So I can just replace this by S Z. Right. And actually there is an H bar here. No, sorry. It should have been H bar earlier also. Um, so that is it. So then I have my, uh, uh, I have my, uh, how it looks like if I replace this, uh, S by sigma, then this will become a sigma. This h bar will go away, and this will become two. Because S is a half uh, sigma, half of sigma. Right? Okay. Now I want to know uh, what this. Uh, so uh, basically, I want to know how this is evolving. So I try to I try to find out something like this. D D T of So you have to do uh, DDT of this thing, and if you do so, uh, what what? Uh, uh, so suppose I suppose I shorten. Let's call this rotation matrix. Uh, let's call this R. So what I am looking at is I h bar DDT of the rotated state R psi, and this of course uh, is I h bar uh, DDT. Of R times psi plus I H bar uh, and then R D psi. Right. 
this i h bar d psi dt is your uh, uh, this, this is the this from here and uh, you can write down that h psi is equal to i h bar uh, d psi dt where this h is not the rotated hamilton it's just a regular hamilton right you can replace that here right you can find dr dt you will have to use the uh, just uh, a simple thing uh, and you basically i think have to insert a R R dagger somewhere, and you can show that this will take uh, the following form, uh, which is R H R dagger plus At our side. Okay, so uh, uh, so th this one was uh, simply H side, right? So what I did is I inserted a, a, a I inserted a R R dagger over here, right? R dagger R side. So that's what gives me this first term. And here I differentiated this R. This is my R. So if you differentiate with respect to t, you see I get omega z by two. Uh, so omega z by two, that is what I get. And then I have a r. Uh, I then then I have a r side because this will also come back. So I'll get r. So now this this is uh, psi r, and therefore I can call this whole thing. Let's say the, my rotated Hamiltonian. So this is my Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. If you do uh, um, if you now calculate this rotating Hamiltonian, so you uh, you have to use this Baker Campbell Hausdorff lemma, right? Uh, which will tell you how to how to deal with this. So as a homework, try to find this out. Right? If you find this out, you will see that this H R in the rotated frame will exactly look like this. Um, okay, I'll write down. First one step probably h bar omega minus omega zero sigma z plus half h bar omega r sigma z. So this is a rotated Hamiltonian, it will look like that. Uh, clearly, now this has a sigma x part as well. So your Hamiltonian now has of diagonal parts, it also has diagonal because of sigma x, sigma z. And I uh, just simplify this thing. If you write in the matrix notation, this is basically going to be equal to half h bar omega is going to be a minus delta delta omega r omega r. Uh, um, yeah. So. Um, uh, remember what was omega r? I don't see it on the board uh, here. So omega r is basically the coming from the transverse field. So it is coming from the coupling part. Right? And delta of, uh, as usual are uh, this uh, uh, zero. So uh, even formally you can show that this, uh, if you go to this rotating frame, your Hamiltonian, first of all, now becomes time independent, right? And, uh, and uh, in, so it's, in the, it's time independent in the rotating frame. Okay, and it's a time dependent. But now you have a you're, you can go back to the time dependence. I told you, you just have to want to know the time dependence of the bare states. You just uh, find the eigenvalues and eigenstates of this state, and this will not be the state. You will not get one and two. You will get some state. Suppose alpha and beta. You want to know what is the probability of finding a state two? Do a projection on state two. So you take a bracket between two and beta, or two and alpha, and uh, you will find out what is the, the state. And that will match exactly that. But the reason I want wanted to have this on the board is because now I can find out easily. I know it's a time depend independent part. I can find out the energy eigenvalues uh, of this thing. Right? So what are the energy eigenvalues? They're very simple, right? Uh, so it's delta squared. So if you write, write down the energy eigenvalues, I mean, let's call this omega r prime. These are basically simply omega r square plus delta square. It's exactly the same thing that we had here. So this this sometimes this will this together 
uh, this will be called, let's say, W, which is equal to capital omega square plus delta square. And this is called the generalized Rabi sequence. It goes, it becomes equal to the Rabi frequency capital omega when the detuning is zero. I remember omega, capital omega is just the coupling have the Hamiltonian, the interaction Hamilton sandwich between the two states you are looking at. Right? So now here, so the energy is of course half h bar times this omega, right? That is the energy. So if I plot this omega r as a function of the detuning. So say I plot it again detuning. Remember, detuning is nothing but omega minus omega zero. So when detuning is zero, it means the laser is on resonance. So say, suppose this is delta equal to zero. At delta equal to zero, my uh, the two energy levels now are just split by omega r, plus omega r and minus omega r. So I have points like this, right? And if you uh, so the function form will such that you will have something which goes up like this. Right? So this is in presence of this omega r. This is omega r. And what I'm plotting here is omega r prime, which is a generalized size sequence. So this is split, but if I did not have an omega r, what is omega r? Remember, is the coupling between the two states. If I set omega r to zero, these two states, actually, if I set omega r to zero and delta also equal to zero, they have the two states have the same in, a, in a zero, uh, omega r prime is zero. Right? So actually, in absence of a coupling, the two states would actually cross, right? So um, the way we have defined it, this, way, this dotted line would be state two, and this dotted line will be state one, right? And they would cross zero uh, 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 But this just simply means that if you have, uh, 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 you don't have any coupling, uh, they, have, they can have the same energy. If you have coupling, this coupling lifts the degeneracy. Uh, this is a uh, this is a notion we will come up over and over in atomic physics and in this kind of experiment is that uh, if you uh, uh, if you uh, if you have coupling you lead it leads to something which is a avoided crossing so your states do not cross anymore so your eigen I, 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 the energy eigen values do not cross right? you don't have the coupling they will cross okay um, these are the very important kinds of consequences by the way. So you could, this is used in uh, transition. So you can start in, so depending on, you could start with uh, a state uh, two here, and you could slowly change the detuning and move over to, uh, uh, move over to here, right? You just take the laser and tune it, detune it. You will end up here. Now you see at very high, large, uh, asymptotically, this state two is no different from the dotted line. But the dotted line has all the characters of state one. So you have eventually basically changed your state system from state two to state one because and then made possible by this avoided crossing. Right? So you tune, tune your detuning and you uh, uh, can take the system from one state to another. Okay. If you did not have the coupling, this would not happen. Also, if you do this, this change in detuning very fast, then uh, this adiabatic way of changing the, the eigenvalue sort of following your change will not work. So there will be there will, uh, around uh, somewhere here, it could just come back to the lower one and you will lose control. But if you do things properly, there is a chance that you will be able to do uh, transfer from state one to state two or state two to state one adiabatically and without loss, loss of any coherence. Okay. Um, now, in this expression, you see if I, um, so the energy as I said is h bar by two omega r prime. In this, if I if I put uh, the condition that delta is uh, much much larger than omega r, so delta is much much larger than omega r, right? So the uh, uh, previous condition which will if we, if it, uh, okay, so if we go, before we go to del, you know, if it were, if, de, uh, if delta equal to zero, we'll get back basically Rabi oscillations. This, this, this system will have these Rabi oscillations in a bare state. In the, uh, in the, uh, in the rotated state, this is the eigen state. 
But okay, anyway, delta if it is very large compared, to, so you are detuning, you are very far detuned from uh, from this one to two transition. So you are not nowhere close here. Then this expression you can just uh, take delta out, right? So I have then I could just write that this is approximately equal to h bar two uh, delta and Yes, please go ahead. Ah, yes, yes. Right. Everything is Hermitian, yes. And no, I am not going to talk about non Hermitian. I think you will talk about density matrices. I didn't want to go. So, the uh, no, if you. Uh, want to include uh, non hermitian so for example next thing we have to actually do is introduce spontaneous and then uh, all these things so i will tell i will tell and that these rabi oscillations will not at with in unit amplitude that we drew last in the last class where we had this uh, at uh, uh, this c2t uh, we had drawn that if my if my if my uh, detuning is uh, so if this is c2 mod square uh, we saw that this will have this nice flops, which will go up to one. If my detuning is equal to zero, of course, if the detuning is not zero, then we have faster oscillations. Um, uh, so if this is uh, detuning not equal to zero, uh, but um, uh, this amplitude remains fixed uh, for if I if I do not if I just consider these Hermitian operators without any uh, uh, any channel of decay. But if we include decays, for example, if we include spontaneous emission for from state two, then this amplitude actually starts to decay. Right? So this, uh, uh, so the uh, and its system will also start to lose its coherence. Yeah. Yeah, that is. I'll give you decay. I am not sure I understand, but uh, the to, if you have a Hamiltonian which is imaginary, uh, it will actually make your eigenvalues uh, in uh, it will not be stationary state. So basically, you, it's another way of saying that you will have a decay. So and that you that you basically put by hand in is the simplest way to do. It. You tell that without coupling, uh, that uh, they do, they will cross basically. We will not see the about it crossing. Yeah, yeah. But without coupling, how will change the delta? Because delta is basically the detuning between. No, no. Um, uh, delta is the detuning, but uh, you could have. Uh, uh, I mean, remember that you your interaction Hamiltonian. This coupling is basically this thing, right? This is your coupling. Yeah. 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 This is very. This is not. Uh, this is not uh, detuning. So your detuning is a separate thing. So this depends only on the elect. This has no uh, omega or, uh, or anything. It has. It is just electric field. Strength of the electric. Mm -hmm. right? so you keep this part fixed. You just suppose you have a laser of e whose intensity you are not changing. Right. All you are changing is its frequency. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't change the. Uh, Still, then, then still, you will see the avoided crossing level. Acha, uh, why do you? If if omega is zero, you will still see a, a omega is omega zero means uh, that there is no less. Of, yeah, so that's there what, is no coupling. Basically. That's what I exactly I'm saying. That if you turn down, uh, uh, then the two states have same energies, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. If the it is it what what does it mean? It means that. You have you could have a system in uh, um, you could have a system uh, so this is a system in state two and uh, you could have a system in state one right and there is a photon which has energy h bar omega zero right also and this one also is h bar omega zero right but they these do, these states do not talk to each other they are independent state so. Uh, whether uh, so this is uh, what i was uh, so I'm trying to say is that whether you have h bar omega zero and uh, uh, and an extra h bar omega zero and the system in state one you just add their energies 
So suppose this is this has energy zero and this has energy h bar omega, right? So your this total energy is h bar omega zero plus zero, so it's h bar omega zero. Now if you go to state two, you do not have a photon anymore. Only have state two, and your energy of state two is h bar omega zero. So the total energy of the system is the same. This the whole thing is dependent on the fact that this one and two are not coupled. They do not talk to each other. The independent level, you have not done anything which with which they interact. If they interact, then there will be splitting. So basically, when the moment you turn on the coupling, the energy levels change. Agreed. Okay, so uh, yeah, so what I wanted to do is, uh, so back here, so I want to just uh, take uh, um, delta out and then I have uh, uh, one plus omega r square by delta square to the power one by two, right? And then I just do a expression, I assume delta is very large compared to omega r. So I can approximately, so this is exact, but now I can, approximately light, write this as h bar by two, and there's a, remember there's a plus minus sign here. So I can write this as plus minus h bar two by delta plus omega uh, uh, r square by four delta. So this fellow is uh, uh, is called the light shift. Also called the in some sense it's the AC Stark shift. It is used in uh, dipole trapping. So note that notice that it depends on the sign of delta. So the total energy of the system now depends on uh, the plus minus sign, but it depends on the sign of delta as well. And uh, this is precisely the force. So, and remember this is under the approximation that uh, uh, this detuning is very far off from resonance. So uh, re remember in the very beginning, I said that this uh, light matter interaction, depending on which regime you are, you can either do drive resonantly transitions. You could also go to a regime where you do not drive transitions, but the primary uh, uh, thing will be a shift in the energy levels. So that is this shift, right? So if you're very far detuned, you have shift in energy level. And depending on your, whether your delta is positive or negative, this energy level either shifts up or down. And suppose now you have a, so how does the dipole trap work then? So suppose you have somehow uh, cooled atoms uh, and you have on, on your laser cool sample of atoms, you focus a laser beam. The moment you focus the laser beam, you have basically have a case where the intensity is changing both in this direction, also in this direction. Strongest here, weakest here, similarly strongest here and weaker here. So you created an intensity gradient. This omega r, remember this is nothing but, this is all same as this capital omega. This capital omega is the same as this, uh, this fellow. This fellow depends on electric field. If you have a gradient in, uh, in the electric field, you have a gradient in omega or uh, capital omega or in gradient in, uh, uh, omega r, however you want to call it, uh, they are the uh, same thing with different notation. Therefore, your energy of the total system is going to change. So the system has some energy here and a different energy here. Similarly, the system will have some energy here and some energy and different energy here. And the gradient, you know that the gradient of energy will give you the basically the force. So if you focus the light, uh, then there will be a, you will have a uh, spatially dependent force on the on the atoms coming from this light shift. And if you if your detuning actually is red detune, which means if your frequency omega is less than omega zero, it turns out that the force is such that it will push the atom to the highest intensity power, power point. Right. So it depends on the detuning of it. Right. And that is what you do to uh, in a dipole trap. So you focus a light through already cold. Ensemble and it will be trapped. But this is a conservative trap. 
which means there is no so so we have so far not introduced any spontaneous change. So this trap does not take away energy, does not give give energy. Actually, what this 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 fellow here tells you, this picture here tells you, is that from uh, from this time to this time, actually, the system is going from state zero to uh, state one to state two, which means it is absorbing energy. From here to here, is it is going from two to one coherently, and it will again come back uh, to two. But when it goes from here to here, it is absorbing. When it is going from here to here, it is actually emitting radiation. So on an average, it is neither taking energy nor giving energy. So your the the external field is causing these transitions in a very coherent. Right. Uh, so this all so the, and we we are basically doing the same thing here. So there is nothing incoherent going on here. So these uh, atoms will be trapped there. But and this is also the reason why you cannot just take cloud of you cannot just focus a laser beam here in the in this lab and expect that atoms will go and trap because the kinetic energy of the atom that is there will just go fall in. So you can think of this as a energy uh, energy well, right? So it's like a well in energy. So unless so. Uh, Unless this, then this well is not very high, by the way. It's very, very, very weak trap. In term, we typically talk in terms of energy, uh, in terms of temperature, where uh, energy is kVT. So, uh, so we talk about in this temperature. So these are maybe a milli Kelvin thing. So very weak. Room temperature, you know, 300 milli Kelvin, very, very high. So atoms will just come, and you'll see a small bump. Okay, it'll come, roll down, and then go up. So you, to have a dipole trap working, you actually have to have pre-cooled atoms first. Then you focus your laser, and if the if kinetic energy atom is already very small, then it will be trapped. Okay, but this is conservative. So now the question is, we'll go back now. So this is a slight uh, sort of detour, but now we'll go back to what will cause this cooling. So this dipole trap does not cause cooling; it can cause trapping, but not cooling. So for cooling, we go back to again uh, our previous uh, sort of discussion, and we now need to introduce uh, spontaneous emission. So, uh, as Professor Dattuta was asking, uh, what uh, happens in uh, non Hermitian matrix? So, everything was Hermitian, all the system oscillation, oscillating coherently. So, uh, so, so, if you introduce spontaneous emission, and this is the most, uh, uh, I mean, this is what I think people are in general uh, out of their BSC are more familiar with. If you, you, uh, so this is this kind of striking result that you go from state one to two and a state and you come back to two and then again go back to one is not what you uh, typically expect. See, you hear that if I put something like in Einstein's A B coefficients or theory of laser lasing, you put a system in state two, then there is a probability that it will emit without presence of anything. There is also a probability that the light the drive will take it from a stimulated absorption. So this part is stimulated absorption, this part is stimulated emission. So what we have done, looked at, at the, up to this point is basically stimulated processes in presence of a light or electric field. So you do a stimulated absorption emission. Uh, but now we, we also know that for some reason, uh, if I put some system here, it will without even in the presence of any real photons, any real electric field, there's a chance that this state uh, atom in state two will decay to state one. This cannot be described by Schrodinger equation or anything. So that the uh, QED is what can explain uh, what causes. It is basically caused by vacuum fluctuations. So you have you basically quantize your electric field, and you think of the electric field once it is quantized as some kind of uh, harmonic oscillator levels, and h bar omega zero, where omega zero is the mode you are looking at. So is you have energy level space by h bar omega zero. So n equal to one is one photon, n equal to two, h bar omega zero is two photon, and so on. But n equal to zero, which is no photon, also has a still has a zero point energy, half h bar omega zero. So this is called vacuum energy, and this is basically this fluctuations in this vacuum energy is what will cause this um, uh, uh, decay from this state two to state one. But we we will basically for our purposes we will just Phenomenologically say that we know for, as a fact that if I have some decay channel, which takes me down to the ground state. So in presence of such a decay, so let's say spontaneous emission, let's say this rate of spontaneous emission uh, is gamma, right? So why rate? Rate is because I, we want something to compare with, right? I said all these things were angular frequency per second units. So rate also has per second units. So if you take, uh, this is basically a, 
uh, 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 the, the same unit. So we'll compare, we have now can compare this uh, rate at uh, rate with all these uh, different other uh, other frequencies, including the Raghu frequencies. So uh, earlier we had uh, so uh, so the correct way, and this will uh, this uh, Professor Dattukto will teach tomorrow is the correct way to describe a system is to uh, use a density matrix formalism, right? So you don't, don't do starting equation; you do a much more uh, uh, more detailed way, way to uh, to look at it. But uh, at the end of the day, this density matrix has terms which are which are called uh, row one one, row two two, and let's say uh, one two and row or let's say row two one. Uh, so uh, so so these diagonal terms of the density matrix are basically represent what is the population in this case row one one is a population in state one, row two two is a population in state two. So basically, row two two is something. Uh, uh, which is mod C2 squared. The only thing is that this is the steady state. Now we are talking about basically steady state population after density. So, uh, so for example, uh, if I time average all this thing, uh, then you know, is the probability of finding in the state two is half. Basically. State one also is half. But this is Coherent. So, we, but depending on where you stopped here, you would have if this was if this oscillation was uh, in absence of any spontaneous emission, it would just go on forever. But if you uh, if you now uh, introduce this uh, uh, spontaneous emission, so uh, I uh, so this uh, this is one. So there are two two. So in absence of uh, anything, I will have this nice looking. Right. Uh, so this is for uh, for for uh, gamma is equal to zero. There is no uh, spontaneous emission. And also, let's say I have uh, let's say my detuning is also zero, so that uh, I look like that. If I have a small gamma, so if I have gamma uh, much much smaller compared to uh, omega capital omega, which is the coupling, Ravi frequency. So what do I see? I actually see that this system uh, oscillates, but uh, it's amplitude, amplitude decay. So I have oscillations which uh, uh, die down slowly. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and the frequency doesn't change, but it dies down. And at some, as it will go to half of the order of half. It depends on what is gamma and what is omega. And if you have too strong uh, uh, decay, so if gamma is, is the other way around, you will not see any oscillations. So if it, this is for gamma much, much larger than omega. So your decay is very fast. So once you put it in state two, it just decays immediately. Doesn't have a chance for the system to go, undergo this nice stimulated emission process, which is very coherent, right? Which also tells you that it can be difficult to observe this uh, kind of Rabi oscillations. This, uh, because uh, you have to ensure that you have enough coupling, which means you have enough power, and uh, you have to have all satisfy all these things, delta equal to zero, and all, all these things. Otherwise, if you are not satisfying, you will basically see a flat curve. So you, after some time, you will just see that uh, uh, this is a uh, yes, yes. Raise that for a while and we'll turn on. So is it is it okay to start the that graph of row two two from half? Like yeah, exceed half. I mean at all. I mean like the the uh, white one only. Because population inversion cannot be in two level, I don't see how you'll do that, right? Uh, no, that's why it cannot happen. So, can no, no, this is oh, sorry, sorry. So, that what you are saying is right, but I should have labeled this. This is a time. So, you are what you are saying is right. So, at, at the end, it is half, right? It, uh, so, what you are saying is steady state picture population inversion. When you say it's in steady state, you cannot have more than half, population. but you see, uh, at I'm looking at transients, 
So on an average, of course, you don't have uh, more than uh, more than half. In steady state, if you have decay, then you don't have more than half. But as I said, that it is of course possible. Uh, this is the whole point here. I understand is very counterintuitive, but you can actually have a population inversion in this case kind of a scenario. This is a population inversion. You have all the everything is in state two. The only the reason it has happened is because there is no spontaneous. Right? But in this in that case, I am not considering uh, spontaneous emission. Yes. When I am considering spontaneous emission, then also transiently I can have yes, population exactly. inversion. Yes. Okay. Transiently. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so uh, in uh, so now the only thing that remains is that you. Re uh, is that I need to write down this uh, row, row to two. See, I knew what this mod C2, uh, so I know uh, that mod C2 uh, tau square, what it looks like. I mean, uh, it is omega capital omega square by omega square by delta square, but uh, the amplitude of it, right? But now I have an extra parameter, which is this comma. So basically, that is what will come in, right? So uh, if you do, if we, I think tomorrow you will see this in full glory. Uh, how this is done, uh, what you will have is omega square over four and the, these are, uh, these will look now familiar because we already have the, uh, the only, there's only one thing which will add, which is this gamma square over four. So, um, uh, so typically when you look at atomic physics or cold atom uh, sort of, uh, uh, textbooks or, 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 or literature, uh, people will uh, also not, instead of using this language, they will actually define something which is uh, the saturation intensity. So they, instead of writing in terms of omega, uh, capital omega and uh, gamma, uh, they write in terms of this I by I saturation intensity. And this is uh, basically two times, um, okay, this again can be slightly not de dependent on what you are looking, which text you are looking at. By the way, I should write down the what are the good places. So uh, you can uh, look at, of course, uh, uh, the Metcalf and Staten. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, Staten, uh, a book called Laser Cooling. Uh, that's one book where you can look at. Uh, um, you can, for just quantum mechanics, uh, uh, Cohen Tanoji is great. Uh, also Sakurai. Uh, and uh, for uh, beginning, uh, it, uh, one good book is uh, is a book by C.J. Foot on atomic physics. And so this is in uh, good, very simple language. And there is a Mark Fox book on quantum optics, right? So most of the literature uh, 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 things will be discussed over there. Um, there's also a quantum optics book by Loudon. Right. So these are the uh, typically uh, what, and uh, let's not forget this fellow. Uh, so there's this uh, uh, something called alkali D-line data by, uh, by, by something, somebody called Daniel Steck. And this is not a book, he also has a book. He has two books, but this is just alkali D-line data. And he uh, reports all the num essential numbers for the alkali atom. And he also gives some brief discussion of how this, com this coming and where, where it is coming and what is the physics going on. I think it's an excellent thing and you should, anybody who's not aware of it should certainly look at it. Okay, um, so, uh, so you can define it in terms of I divided by I saturation. Um, uh, this uh, and so these are details, but this I saturation actually depends on, uh, uh, among other things, uh, it depends on gamma square and and it depends on the polarization of the light, which is and the uh, dipole moment. I'm not writing the full expression. So polarization of light affects the saturation intensity. If you have different gammas that are uh, affected. Also, if the strength of the transition d is the uh, d is basically the uh, dipole moment, so it's a uh, omega kind of thing, right? So that so everything is affected. But once you do this transfer, then you can write the same expression rho two two, which is a steady state. So this is the steady state. And uh, you were asking uh, uh, about half. See this one. You look at whether this will go to more than half, right? And this won't actually. 
So at steady state, uh, uh, this is uh, this. Also, um, okay, so let me just write this down in terms of root uh, two, which is equal to basically one by two i divided by i saturation. What am I doing on time? And uh, one plus i by i saturation plus O delta squared by Okay, why did I write this, right? The reason I wrote this is now we are very close to understanding what is this scattering force which uh, we were after, which is what is causing our laser cooling. So remember the picture that we have is that the atom, the atom which is moving with some speed V. And I have a laser which is coming in from the other direction, which is frequency omega, momentum h bar k. And therefore, when it absorbs, it will give a kick in this direction. Right? This is called a scattering force. Why is it called a scattering force? It is not because it's absorbing, because you know, if as I said, if it only absorbs, it will also emit. Right? So the question is each event gives me momentum kick h bar k right so what is the force on the system force of the system is momentum rate of change of momentum right so i need to know how many times in a second i have this kind of a this kind of a momentum coming in and uh, so this uh, basically let's call this this scattering force as f scatter or let's just write f s for i don't want to repeat uh, or maybe once i write if scattering, uh, uh, so this is equal to the uh, photon momentum, which bar k, right, into uh, the scattering rate. What is the meaning of scattering rate? How many times the photon is scattered per second, right? Because you see, unless the photon is scattered, the system goes from state uh, state one to uh, state two. Unless it scatters the spontaneously emits and comes back to one, it cannot absorb another photon. So I'm limited by how fast actually it is giving out the photon. So this R scattering rate will R scatter will clearly depend on what? On gamma, right? How far, right? And what else will it depend on? It will also depend on what is the population in state two. So this, uh, uh, so I if I put everything in, then I, I will basically so this is equal to h bar k uh, into uh, basically the gamma and rho 2 2 that is the uh, probability that I find the system in state 2. Now I just put the expression right I already wrote down the expression so this f scatter is uh, basically h bar k um, gamma 2 and then this same thing. Any idea what is the maximum? So, okay. So, let, we can find the maximum force. Uh, let's say if scatter maximum, how much is this? First of all, when does it happen? Um, when you have very uh, large intensities, right? That is when it will happen. This fellow will be basically be one, and you or you have delta equal to zero and very high intensity, and then you have. So what is the value? The value is uh, uh, h bar k gamma over two. Any idea how much acceleration this produces? Remember the acceleration is uh, a max is basically this f f max like force divided by mass of the atom, right? Any idea how much it is? Guess, wild guess. Let's say uh, gravitational you know, acceleration is 10, right? Uh, around 10 meter per second. Right? In terms of gravitational acceleration, do you think it's more than that, less than that? Huh? More than that. How much more? That's correct, but how much more? 
So while the photon is a nice little fellow, this number is 10 to the power 5G. Huge acceleration. And that is why laser cooling works. And that's, that's why it's so robust. And you go to the lab, you do everything correctly, it will work. You, you will get cold atoms if you do uh, a lot of things right. Of course, you have to keep all your detunings and everything uh, uh, to be perfect, but it will work because of this. Okay. Uh, so, okay, for this, but for to get this, as I said, to get this maximum acceleration, you have to have your detunings right, right? You have to have, you cannot have infinite intensity. So, one thing you can do is you can kill this delta equal, make this delta equal to zero. And therefore, this will be reduced and you will get a large scattering force, right? So, that's, so you want to have a effectively a small delta. But this, uh, you know, as, as we had drawn earlier, that if you have a oven, and atoms are coming out of this uh, with, some velocity, with some velocity v and it absorbs and it slows down. So the velocity keeps changing. If the velocity keeps changing, then there's a Doppler shift. It does not absorb the same laser anymore. So what do you do? So, uh, uh, so, so suppose you have devised some mechanism which keeps your laser on resonance, right? And you ensure that it is getting this maximum acceleration. Right? So if that is the case, you know, if the, if the if the atom starts at let's say z equal to zero, and uh, I am looking at some place uh, L zero, which is very far from z equal to L zero. Uh, yes. In this, this is the broadening. So I should have said this. Uh, this is this. Uh, this uh, is uh, this is the scattering rate. Uh, okay, the numbers are. Um, okay, so this so for typical rubidium, I should have said this. Thank you. Uh, so for let's say rubidium. This gamma, what is the rate? This the reason that number is so large is actually because this is around 38 into 10 to the power six per second. This gamma. Uh, people who know are in atomic physics, this is nothing but twice pi times uh, six point six around twice pi times six megahertz. You might be more familiar with this number, six megahertz. That's the line width of the transmission. So, so that is actually the. Uh, uh, well, it depends. I mean, for the in this case, all these, uh, uh, at, this is just the line width. So, this is the, every atom has this broad. But uh, uh, on top of this, of course, when the atoms are moving, they will absorb a different. That will cause inhomogeneous burning, and that is this Doppler effect. So, if you have a room temperature gas, you will have inhomogeneous burning. But this is the natural line width. So this is same for all atoms. Okay, so here if I ensure that the acceleration is a, then use I want to calculate what is the distance at which this uh, atom starting at uh, velocity v zero at z uh, at uh, at a state from z zero it comes to rest. That is what I'm interested in. So what do I do? I say that okay, my v square is equal to uh, v zero square minus the uh, because it's decelerating uh, a times uh, let's say. L zero. That's where uh, a times uh, uh, basically a times z. But uh, I want my v to be uh, uh, zero, right? The final velocity to be zero. So from this gives me uh, 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 l zero. Uh, uh, what is the stopping distance? Right? So what is the stopping distance? The stopping distance is simply uh, v zero squared by two a. V zero is the initial uh, uh, velocity of the atom, and uh, two a is the acceleration. The radiate. Uh, it is absolutely essential the radiate. Unless they radiate, there is no force on the system. Yes. The they have to scatter. They have to scatter the light out. Spontaneous emission. They, so something has to take away the energy. So typically, uh, in uh, this L0 is typically of the order of one meter. If you, for any alkali you take, if you put all this. So for each alkali, this V0 starting velocity is actually different. That's because you have to heat this system to different temperatures to actually make a vapor. Uh, and therefore, V0 is for each alkali is different. Uh, the acceleration is slightly different. But it turns out that if you compute for any of them, it will be of that order. Everything is between around 1 meter. Maybe 0 0.8, 1.2 doesn't matter, but it's around 1 meter. So if you have this much length, it will stop. You can make it. Now we have to make only make sure that this acceleration remains this 
a max or whatever you want which means you have to control your detune how do you do you make use of you want to basically compensate the doppler shift what is the doppler shift the doppler shift if you recall is uh, is simply the p by c times the frequency of the laser so whatever the source frequency is times the speed at which uh, something is uh, traveling divided by the uh, the c is the frequency of the light uh, we typically write it in terms of uh, 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 in angular frequency units so you multiply so this c is nothing but uh, uh, f times f times uh, lambda and then we uh, 2 pi i just multiply at 2 pi and write it in terms of k 2 pi by lambda is k so this is just k times v um so or in if for any direction it will be just k dot right so depending on r and k is the wave vector right so this uh, uh, k is uh, twice pi by lambda so this is the this is the so doppler shift is uh, omega doppler is uh, uh, k times v depending on the velocity so i have now a situation where uh, i want to basically apply a magnetic field right so magnetic field between this region and this region i want to compensate this doppler shift with the zeeman shift as i was saying earlier right so so if i look at the energy level of the system right uh, without any uh, any magnetic field is h bar omega 0 and i have added uh, a magnetic field which gives me mu b times bz remember this was a drop this is coming from the mu dot b interaction and I, we had done this hyperfine remember gj mu b and and then mf b and then we have two states if you here it is the two rubidium states let's say f equal to 2 to f equal to 3 so the, the each of them will shift but if you take the you have to take the difference right so in the, when you look at the is omega 0 if you take that this is what you get anyway it will be linear in b uh, uh, and multiplied with the bohr magneton okay and then this has to be matched with the laser frequency which is h bar omega i laser frequency time i'm writing the energy so I'm multiplying by h bar everywhere um, uh, and the doppler shift right so this plus kv actually kv is the frequency so maybe h bar omega plus kv and that is uh, basically that is it i mean so you basically now uh, uh, write down what is b, uh, bz bz equal to uh, h bar omega minus omega 0 so this is uh, h bar by mu b omega minus omega 0 plus um uh, h bar k uh divided by mu b times v right and what is v v okay so times v okay so v now i want to write down in terms of uh the stopping distance so i want to write down this expression right so this v is nothing but v0 square or rather uh, v0 square ko hum likhte hain let's write it in terms of l0 so this v0 square is um, help me out twice a l0 right minus z right so this is v square uh, minus a z right hmm Okay, and a can also be written in terms of. Uh, okay, I'm. Uh, what do I want to take out? I don't. I sorry. So I basically uh, okay. So I want to uh, keep uh, v zero and l zero and take a out. Basically, that's what I want to do. 
Um, so I can write this A in terms of V0 by uh, L0. Uh, so if I do that, then this will be, this fellow, uh, this A will be, this term will be, um, uh, so twice A will be V0 square uh, Z, right? So then I can write this thing as simply V zero one minus Z by L zero the power one. This is just the detuning, which is fixed, let's say, and basically I don't care. This is, it gives you some bias field. And this is the dependence I want. So Z to the power one by two kind of dependence. So if I, if I make, so this, what does the actually the field looks like? You know, uh, the field will actually look like this. If I have, if I have Z equal to zero and Z equal to L zero, which is stuff, this is the, this is the magnetic field. If I make a magnetic field in this way, the atoms will come to stop at the end. So I have to make, you have to devise a way to make this. And this you can do with solenoids. You have a solenoids with different windings and therefore you can make a magnetic field like that and pull your atoms and slow your atoms down. Oh, okay, uh, this, this one, this one, right? See, uh, H bar omega zero is my, uh, this two level ka energy difference, right? One and two. This is h bar omega zero. I want the atoms to absorb this photon and scatter to get this h bar omega momentum kick. Unless it absorbs, it will not get the kick. But the point is, once it absorbs, it emits, its velocity has changed. Therefore, it is moving slower. Therefore, it does not, it sees a Doppler shift because it, you know, moving things have a Doppler shift, different Doppler shift. So the, and the Doppler shift keeps changing because if it absorbs, uh, one photon again it will change. So I have to make sure that whatever the Doppler shift is, right? That what is the Doppler shift? Suppose h bar omega was a laser frequency, omega was a laser frequency, the Doppler shift is k times b, k plus b. So this is actually what is the frequency the atom is seeing in its frame. If v equal to zero, then it sees just omega. V change if if it is moving towards the laser, it says plus kv. If it is moving away, it says minus kv. So suppose I have the way I have drawn the laser is first coming in from this direction. So it says a plus kV. So, uh, so I have to come, this is the laser frequency that the atom sees. This has to be equal to the energy level structure of the atom. Without magnetic field, it would be h bar omega zero. So if V changes and I have no tuning parameter here, V changes, it, you, these two terms cannot be equal. All, you have to have something which, and that something fortunately as the atom moves, uh, and slows down, it also moves. So there is, you can use this uh, spatial dependence of the, of, the, of the motion of the atom and the Zeeman effect to compensate. So as the atom moves, here it was moving fast, here it is moving slightly slower. Therefore, your magnetic field, you can tune it to address that here the atom will again absorb. Okay. Okay. In the... I uh, almost the end of it. So the last thing I want to sort of talk about is, uh, which is the magneto optical trap where, uh, so we have a slow atom beam right now, uh, or maybe, maybe before the magnetic trap, maybe this should, probably should do the uh, optical molasses. That's better. So yeah, before that, so now you have slow atoms. Now you want to slow them further. Um, so this will, uh, it is a beam, it is a unidirectional slowing. So typically people want to do a three dimensional uh, slowing. So any atoms moving in any direction should not be moving in any direction. So what do you do? You basically use the same principle in all three directions. Uh, so if you now have a two level system now, but you have now, uh, uh, two lasers, which are, so I have my levels uh, one and two, uh, but uh, suppose, uh, uh, suppose there's an atom here and suppose, uh, uh, 
I have some uh, laser which is at a frequency omega, right? and I put a laser coming in this way and coming in that. So you see the atom is at rest; it will uh, it will uh, experience a scattering force. This scattering force, but if it has, it is uh, it is at rest. This detuning is the same for both because there is no Doppler shift. So by some rest, we just see, so both of them see see the same scattering force for both these beams. So this one as and this one, but one of them is pushing it that way, the other one is pushing it that way. So the force is balanced, and the atom sees no force. If the atom is at rest, no force. This is what we want at the end of the process. That atom has cooled down. Now it, the, you have lasers, but it is not going to do anything. But if the atom is moving, right? So we, initially the atom will be moving. So what is happening there? So suppose uh, I have now again this energy uh, level one and two. Uh, my laser is tuned. Uh, frequency is omega. I'm intentionally drawing it slightly uh, lower than the transition frequency. I, we will see why that is necessary. Um, okay. So now, suppose the atom is moving in this direction, this atom, with a velocity v, and there is a laser which is come, coming in from here. The laser has frequency omega, but it will see a Doppler shift. So, the frequency that the atom will see from for this laser will be, uh, I mean, so this will be omega plus kV because the atom is moving towards the laser. I have a laser also from the other direction, same frequency, everything is the same. In fact, they're derived from the same laser and just split, right, and send it from different direction. But now for the atom is moving away from the laser. So for this laser, the Doppler shift is, uh, in a different direction. So it will be omega minus kV will be the frequency it will see. And of course, multiplied by h bar will give you the energy, right? So now what you have is a differential force because if, if this laser, she's a shift, higher shift, and if it becomes close to this transition, one to two transition, it can scatter is more, right? It has it, the transition, so will be the wave scattering will be more. On the other hand, the scattering from this one will be less because it is further detuned. Remember, if, the, if now this delta, what has happened now is because of the motion, this delta, which is a detuning, omega minus omega zero, also has this kV part, right? So if the detuning is large, then the scattering force actually decreases. Detuning is zero, largest scattering force. So in this case, that is what you use. So, so they will preferentially, now uh, for a motion of the atom, it will preferentially absorbing uh, one, uh, uh, from one direction and therefore have a preferential force in one direction. How much is the force? This force is called, this is called an optical molasses if you do it in three dimensions. This is, I'm drawing a one dimension, but you can have lasers in all six directions. Uh, same things will happen in the other three directions. Um, so this force, let's call it molasses once. And this, by the way, does not require any magnetic field. This part. So far, I, we have cooled. Us. Suppose now there is no in the region where this is happening, there is no magnetic. Okay. Uh, so this will be uh, the scattering force <clears throat> due to omega minus omega zero minus kV, right? Uh, so this is for this one. So this is the force in this direction. Right, omega minus kV and minus this uh, scattering force from the, uh, this, the other laser, which is in this direction. Right, so that's that's why this is the negative. There is a negative uh, sign there, and this is omega minus omega zero plus kV. Now you basically put that expression, that scattering force expression. There is a delta there. That delta will be now replaced by omega minus omega zero minus kV. And you can just expand it around omega minus omega zero. So uh, <clears throat> when you expand this one, it will be some uh, uh, scattering at around omega minus omega zero minus kV uh, del f del omega. And this one will be the same if scattering uh, uh, at omega minus omega zero uh, plus kV. Uh, Del 
So uh, what do you get? You just get uh, minus two kV del F del omega. And if you put all the expressions over there, so let's call this. Uh, so uh, so see there is a V here. So let's call this two. Let's call this is equal to minus or I think it's minus minus alpha V. Okay, where alpha is the rest of the thing. So two K del F del omega. And if you do the math for small intensities, uh, uh, this will be something like with some constant, it will be minus two delta by gamma divided by one plus twice delta by gamma whole squared. This is for small intensities. Anyway, so now you see you have a force which looks like a friction, frictional force, alpha v. Alpha, by the way, must be a positive number if you have to have a minus sign, if you want a frictional force, which is opposing the motion of the velocity, which means this will depend on this detuning. Turns out that this will be alpha will be positive only if, if your detuning is less than zero or you are red detuned. That is why we are always drawing this line below the transition energy. Otherwise, the other direction actually it will accelerate the, the atom, right? So it will not work. So this is a damping or the friction kind of force. And this is what, uh, so this is also, uh, this is going to damp your uh, uh, system. So, uh, so the question is, it has alpha B. So if I write down an energy equation, it seems like the energy will go to zero, right? It, it keeps, it keeps getting, getting damped and uh, then they eventually will go to zero. But that does not happen because of question that was asked is, what we have only looked at is the average from the scan spontaneous emission, but there is a random walk because of this average photon kick, which is getting, it is getting from after emission of the photon. So every time it emits, it gets on an average, it is zero, the momentum kick, but then still it will have, will move this way, this way, this way. So there will be uh, some mean square displacement and some in, in the velocity space, and that will give you a limit to how low you can go, right? And you can, there's a formal way of doing this. But you see, there's also a, another way to look at it. See, the only scale right now in our, in our system is that gamma, the dissipation rate gamma. So that, if I, uh, so that, and that is the smallest energy scale actually. If you multiply that with, that is 2.2 pi times six megahertz, right? So that is actually the smallest energy. So if you multiply this with uh, 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 KB, so basically, uh, basically, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, if you if you want a temperature sort of out of it, this is going to be of this order, gamma uh, multiplied by h bar. In fact, h bar by two. So this gives you an estimate of what is the minimum temperature you will reach with this system if you have only that damping or that scattering rate, which is causing giving rise to this damping. And this typically, this temperature is of the order of let's say. I think it's for rubidium, it is uh, 140 micro Kelvin for rubidium. And uh, sodium, it is, I think, 240 or something like that, or 230. So it's of this order. This is, uh, this is how cold you can go by using, making use, uh, uh, making use of this uh, uh, Doppler uh, limit. And if you are interested in the, uh, if you are interested in the speed, then the speed is of the order of one meter per second. So up to that velocity, you can. Okay, so now, uh, so last comment and then Lian, this, what people do is not only, so this will still drift at this velocity. So what you do is now at the end, you in the, actually in the experiment, what you have is you also have a magnetic, so you have a anti helmholtz coil, right? So you have some current passing here and current passing in the other direction. Therefore you create a magnetic field, which looks like this. Zero at the center and, and it directs and depends on the direction, right? So, and what will happen is that because, so at the center, you have your transition energy is h bar omega zero. As you go away from the center, magnetic fields is, is different at different places. Therefore, your energy will slide as even slower. Your energy level will have a Z dependence, spatial dependence. And if you do everything right, uh, you can have, uh, so you can have a case, a case where 
uh, you, the atoms basically absorb only preferentially again from one of the laser beams, and therefore it gets pushed to the center. So I think we are running out of time. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I should go over, but uh, so what you have, so if I look at just briefly, maybe if I look at the, suppose I have a two level system, the ground state is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some uh, j equal to zero and the excited state is j equal to one. In this kind of a system, when I have a magnetic field pointing this way, uh, uh, here uh, on, the, on the left side of z, of z equal to zero, I have a B field pointing this way, and on the right I have uh, in this way, and the B uh, is zero here, my in mj levels will split. So mj equal to plus one will look like that, mj equal to zero and mj equal to minus one. On the left hand side, it's the opposite direction because my magnetic field has flipped sign. So my mj's minus one state is, uh, has higher energy on this side. So now you basically have the same configuration of like the optical molasses, but now you also add the polarization of the, use the polarization of the. Remember, the, uh, so I put a laser, uh, our, my lasers are coming in from both directions, this direction, as well as from this direction, similar to there. Earlier we had no polarization. Now I, I put a polarization. So suppose I put I have a sir, left circularly polarized sigma minus polarization here, and I have a, how can I draw it? Let's say sigma plus polarization here, right? So what that means is we told that the selection rules. Remember the first class is that sigma minus will drive a transition which changes. Uh, 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 delta m by minus one. The ground state has j equal to zero. Basically, mj is also zero. So it will try. So on the right hand side, actually, this, this or basically this laser will drive this transient from here to this state. This laser can only drive a transient from here to this state. Plus, uh, uh, I mean, okay. So this state ni, matlab, it can go to mj equal to plus one. But note that if this laser is on this, if when you are looking at this laser, suppose, suppose the atom is here. So the, suppose the atom is located at this position, right? At this position, laser frequency is fixed. Both the lasers are coming, right? But uh, the energy level is such that it can absorb this laser, which is close to this resonance. Suppose it is very close to this resonance. So it will absorb this uh, sigma minus transition, which is from this laser beam. But, this beam it will not be able to absorb, absorb because this beam causes a transition from here to mj equal to plus one, right? So therefore, it will uh, only absorb from this laser and this gives you a po basically position dependent uh, shift. So in, in addition to this velocity uh, term, so you will have, if you include basically here, k, k dot vk sat, if you include, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 so basically, there is some some beta, some constant times z, right? M f times z. Uh, the Zeeman's uh, uh, thing was uh, so something like that. So uh, so depending on the where you are, and here it will be some uh, plus. So here it will be minus beta z because of the directions and all. And now you will do an expansion not only in del f del omega but also in terms of z. So uh, so and if you do that, you will get another another plus something here. And that plus something will be a restoring force. If you do the uh, uh, math, it will be so. The if you do it in a mod, this force, this molasses force will, uh, uh, of course, be acting there. So minus alpha v will be there. But uh, when you have this additional thing, we also have this minus alpha beta by k into z. This is this minus k x or k z kind of force, restoring force. This is what gives the atom. Even uh, and uh, at the center, the store and it goes away. It basically pushes it. So you had the molasses, which was which was giving you one meter per second, slowly drifting out atoms at one meter per second. But this will keep you uh, from diffusing out. Basically, will give you a restoring force. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, this uh, this is so. If you actually this will give you so typically top uh, temperatures in a mod is actually slightly less than this. If you actually don't have this, suppose you 
uh, suppose you have an atoms in this mod, uh, uh, let's say 100 micro Kelvin, and you switch off the magnetic field and just apply for some time just this molasses beams without the magnetic field. So then you would expect that the only the molasses part should work and the temperature should be of this 100 or 100, something like that, right? People measured when they measured, they measured a much lower uh, temperature. And this lower temperature actually came from because of something which is called the polarization gradient. So please look it up. Uh, uh, gradient cooling. So a complicated thing in the sense that it depends on the polarization. Uh, so you see you have two laser beams which are coming with different polarizations, right? See, preferentially it is absorbing one of the beams. And it turns out that if you look at which of these transitions is strong. So if I if you have a typical typical in a M, a, suppose these are M J equal to uh, uh, zero transition and uh, uh, and here it is plus one, uh, zero and minus one in the alkali atoms, it turns out that these are the strong transitions compared to, uh, compared to for example, this one, okay. So atoms preferentially will, the, so the, they will be, what does it mean to have a strong transition? It actually means that this Rabi frequency that was there is stronger. So the shift in the energy level is stronger for them, right? And now you see uh, the, because your polarizations are different in everywhere, the energy, the energy level shift, spatially dependent energy level shift along this entire space. And this can be used to take away more energy from the system. And that actually that process also involves uh, both this uh, uh, polarization gradient involves both this uh, Rabi picture and also spontaneous emission. And you can actually go to much lower temperature. Typically like maybe 20 micro Kelvin so is not very, uh, difficult. Okay, so I think I have exceeded my time. I'll stop, but uh, we can discuss whatever you want over tea. But if you have questions now, I'll take those. I don't know. I mean, what do you mean by non non unit? Yeah. Anything else online? Anything? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, I have a general question. Uh, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, sir, um, as uh, your description of the laser uh, dipole force on the atoms, uh, regarding that, I have a question. Go ahead. So, yeah, as the uh, field is uh, oscillating in nature, so there will be some uh, induced uh, oscillating dipole moment on the atoms due to this oscillating field. So, oh. uh, yeah. So, so, uh, then the interaction Hamiltonian uh, between the atom and the field uh, will have the terms um, that includes uh, two uh, products of uh, oscillating terms. That means uh, cosine sine and cos sine cos. That means product terms, uh, product oscillating terms. So then how your description of this uh, dipole force uh, can be modified for this case? Oh, no, uh, so the, I, you are asking, uh, see we started with uh, the electric field E0 cos omega t, which was oscillating. Yes. Sir. And uh, when we uh, sort of talked about the dipole force, uh, we said that we have done this rotating wave approximation, which I was trying to motivate what it means like. And when you do this, uh, after this, uh, this rotate in the rotating frame, this Hamiltonian does not have a time dependence. And what I had plotted there was, uh, or uh, drawn there was the energy levels of the system in this, uh, under this rotating wave approximation, and there is no time dependence over there. Um, that I understood, sir. That I understood, sir. sir yeah, I'm considering little different scenarios, sir, where, you know, uh, the dipole moment is also oscillating. Then the interaction of Hamiltonian will take the different form. That's what I'm saying. Dipole moment is oscill oscillating. Uh, the atomic dipole moment that is induced by the field. I don't, I think this, in this case also, the dipole, I mean, See, we had this, remember we had this ER dot 
E zero cos omega t, where cos omega, this was the light field. So actually, uh, I mean, uh, you if you look at it together, it is a oscillating dipole. Yes, sir. Uh, I I am considering when E R also has some uh, time dependence. That is oscillating time dependence. Then there will be another extra term uh, like cos omega t or sine omega t, something that. Yeah, maybe I have to think about it. I do not understand exactly what it is. Yeah, I have to think. I don't really understand. Okay, thanks. I mean, maybe. So, sir, another thing I want to highlight that uh, you know in the definition of the Rabi frequency. Uh, that you uh, have defined, uh, sir. Uh, for a dimensional analysis, there should be a, a age bar in the denominator. I think otherwise, omega cannot be expressed in the unit of frequency. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. This uh, we had done. So, what was this? Was what uh, was the let's say. Uh, uh, this will be fine. Yeah. This will be fine. Yeah, but this is how we had defined in the earlier class. I've just been a slightly sloppy in here, but uh, okay, okay, thank you. Sir. That's right. So this one, yeah, should have an H bar. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No, no, no. This one. This is coming from this this place, which I was telling. So if you see the force now depends on space also, if you have this circular progression, right? So uh, uh, if it, uh, and the energy levels also depend on uh, a space, right? So the detunings also depend on space. So earlier we had just uh, our, uh, our, we only had to write omega minus kV depending on, and there was no spatial dependence, right? Uh, so we were only writing omega minus kV. But now uh, this is no longer true because I also have this uh, energy level which is changing, right? So, I have, so my it was h bar omega zero, so basically omega zero, right? And there was a omega zero, omega zero minus kV. But now I also have a z dependence. So my force, scattering force, now becomes a function of omega, omega zero, kV, and that z. Uh, it turns out that this is just uh, mu b times z. So this is just a constant times z is the magnetic field dependence, energy level difference. So, uh, so far I feel now I will have to put this this fellow also in here and basically do the same expansion, right? Uh, so I will have uh, del f del omega, but I also will have a del f del z, right? And that del f del z times whatever is there uh, will give me uh, will give me this term. Now I have not given any mathematical expression for polarization gradient. Uh, so what I was trying to say is that after you have all this mod and atom strapped, um, you can actually go to even lower temperature. So this mod atoms will uh, go to this kind of uh, uh, temperature uh, Doppler cooling limit. But ultimately, as, I, as somebody had asked, what is the ultimate limit is this recoil limit that you can cool enough that energy imparted by a single moment, a single photon. In terms of you can go very, not really close, but uh, you can do basically better than this, somewhere between this and that single photon recoil uh, limit. And the way this works is because of polarization gradient. So what happens is that this uh, energy level structure, now you have two beams, so, so, uh, and it, it, it preferentially absorbs one of the, one of these, uh, uh, one of, from one of these transitions. And uh, along, see you have two beams, therefore you actually have a gradient in the polarization. So it is easier to think if you, See this, if you just think of uh, linear polarization, uh, if you have, so if you imagine you have a, a electric field, which is oscillating in this way, coming from, from this direction. So let's say laser coming in this direction. Uh, and suppose we have a, a another, so this is, let's, let's call whatever X, let's call this Y. And there is a laser beam coming in this direction, which is in, in the orthogonal. So one is oscillating this way, one is oscillating this way. So you see, if they are not exactly in phase, depending on what is their phase, if you look at anywhere in between, they will have, you have to, when you look at the components, right, of this and add up the components of this, it could have any direction, this total electric field. So for a certain phase, uh, it will have a state where 
it could be uh, uh, sort of at some place if this is where this is zero let's say it will point like this and uh, and where where this is uh, this fellow is zero it will point point like this but in somewhere between this it will point in some arbitrary direction so it's like a circular polarization basically uh, the polarization basically the polarization is changing at at spatially right so which means uh, uh, now uh, we also said that this transition strain depend on the polarization and this typically this sigma plus or sigma minus transitions are the strongest so what that means is that this because the uh, because and this will determine the strain will determine this rabi frequency omega and remember that determines a shift in the energy level right so the what will happen is that one of the state the states will have some kind of a modulation in their energy levels so this is just z position say say this m j equal to plus 1 state modulates in this way because just because of where it is strong and where it is weak where the laser is more preferentially absorbs uh, uh, the circular plus sigma plus and where it absorbs sigma minus the mj state might have actually has a, a, a energy level like that so where mj so now suppose here there is an, another excited state uh, where this M, this transition can occur but uh, it, the same laser cannot cause this uh, transition from here to here so if you can arrange in a way so the suppose the ground state of the has this kind of a st structure and your laser is here and therefore, therefore the laser will absorb the photon here when it is at at a higher energy point here now as it moves it might scatter the photon out this scattering might happen immediately in that case whatever is absorbed is given off therefore you don't gain anything in terms of or lose anything but suppose the atom moves a little bit before it scatters right or it does not move but in, when the scattering happen it happens to the other state right so in that case it has lost more energy than it has absorbed therefore this is taking away energy from the system but this is a very so this shift but is a very small number remember we said the dipole trapped up this is the same as a dipole force kind of a dipole kind of force so this is maybe 1 millikelvin of that or i don't know some number very small number so it is it is a small modulation in the uh, uh, so kb times uh, this temperature will give you the energy scale but it will this happens and this lets you cool even more than just the doppler cooling Okay, so I think we can. Yes. Uh, we are talking about the required moment. Yes. The meeting temperature. Ah. So when we observe that, that can be associated with the harmonic oscillation. 